good evening everyone and uh, again i begin by thanking overman foundation for giving me the opportunity of delivering talks on sri aurobindo's the future poetry now sri aurobindo has written at length on the character and course of english poetry in his book the future poetry we have discussed sri aurobindo's views and analysis of the national evolution of poetry in our last talk and it's in continuation of that uh, we may follow sri aurobindo as he sketches the general character of english poetry he has devoted a good many essays to this subject maybe because he felt that english poetry was among the richest and naturally powerful of the poetry of all european languages but sri aurobindo points out the drawbacks of this poetry too okay so first let us see as sri aurobindo shows us what is the general nature and character of english poetry but before that let's take a quick glance at the contribution of the english nation to human life and culture at large and thereby ascertain the nature of the national mind of england sri aurobindo talks about the different national capacities and says that england's contribution or achievements in art and culture are very little in comparison with the rich achievements of other european nations like uh, say france italy spain or holland pointing out the lacunae he says that in music and sculpture england scores almost a zero its architecture is somewhat better and in the field of painting we can have a few great names perhaps but there's no great artistic tradition as such the same goes for achievements in the field of science with a few famous names here and there but without a national scientific culture so england's influence on others on european thought especially is not of any considerable importance but in practical life england has an unqualified preeminence sri aurobindo says in politics commerce colonization exploration and domination of earth and exploitation of its riches england is the leader and sometimes entirely the world's leader and here we must remember the historical time in which sri aurobindo made these observations england practically ruled the world then so what are the causes for this imbalance of national capacities sri aurobindo asks and he attributes the main cause to racial characteristics the anglo saxon strain when fused with the scandinavian and celtic elements produced a national mind which was dynamic and practical it had all the strength and patience of the teutonic character without its heaviness and crudity so the english nation is good at dealing with the practical difficulties of life and this it does by the vital instinct and dynamic intuition and not so much by intellectual thought or force of imagination so it displays a robust ethical mind with a strong turn for action for abundant energy but no spirituality or fine play of emotion here this sri aurobindo says is one element of the national mind of england then there is the celtic spirit submerged yet which cannot be ignored and this brings into the national mind just the opposite qualities of spirituality imagination luminous intelligence uh, emotional force and sympathy it also brings with it remnants of a forgotten mystic tradition with its natural love of things of the mind and beyond the mind the cruder anglo-saxon nature and its excesses are modified refined and toned down by the subordinate element so evidently here are two strains and in the poetry of the english people we see how they are reflected and sri aurobindo says and i'm quoting 
from the ferment of these two elements, from the vigorous but chaotic notion created by their fusion and their clash, arise both the greatness and the limitation of English poetry." Unquote. Okay, so it's time now to look at this greatness and this limitation. We have already dwelt a while on the English national mind and now the question is what kind of poetry can such a mind produce? Let us first see what Sri Aurobindo has to say in praise of English poetry. English poetry, according to Sri Aurobindo, displays lavish and unfettered play of poetic energy. Its innate genius, abundant power have produced brilliant poetry as we see in the works of numberless poets who have flooded the English literary scene, uh, say Shakespeare, Spencer, Tennyson, Browning, Arnold, and the list, it goes on. And just to name only a few among a galaxy of poets, where we ought not to expect any poetic achievement at all because of the Anglo-Saxon strain in the makeup of the national mind. In fact, in Europe generally, there was a long gap between the rude epical writings and any significant achievement or production in the poetic field. Sri Aurobindo gives the instance of Germany, which being so rich in music, philosophy and science, had rarely anything to offer in poetry. After the achievements of the genius like Goethe or Heinrich Heine, again there was a long void, a stillness. In other parts of Europe too, the same void can be seen in the poetic field with one or two solitary figures like Ibsen or Strindberg emerging out of the stillness and linking the gaps. This may be due to the heaviness of the Teutonic character, its strength and depth and thickness of composition which hardly allows the light and fire of the poetic word to pass through the outer envelopes of the intellectual and the vital. Fortunately, England has been saved from this general taciturnity of the European mind. And Sri Aurobindo says this may be due to a couple or so of reasons. First of all, England has the intervening force of other racial strains and the Celtic spirit which helped to liberate the poetic spirit. And there has also been what Sri Aurobindo calls the fortunate accident of reshaping the Teutonic language and spirit by the French and the Latin. Due to their influences, the English language acquired that plasticity which helped to give its poetry larger and subtler effects and clearer and more flowing forms. Though England could not put forth her greatest energies, yet the character of the English language reshaped by foreign influences made it possible for poetry of great beauty and power to be produced. And because of this predominantly Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Norman character of the national mind, we have a long continuity of poetic production in England. But it's not that, however, that the English spirit is completely and adequately reflected in and through its poetry. As there have been different motives and various influences and fluctuations, a neat and final fusion or conciliation was never brought about. So English poetry was never clearly self-conscious. However, we should expect, and we do have, strong objective poetry reflecting mainly the external life. So in early English poetry, we see an energetic portrayal of character and action, robust play of will and passions, and depiction of the outsides of nature. There is in this vital and physical poetry 
a criticism of external life with themes more suited to prose writing. In this Anglo-Norman poetry are also included political and ecclesiastical motives, satire and didactic themes woven into powerful narrative and though there is displayed a great energy in drama of character and incident, there's hardly any profounder use of the dramatic form. Similarly, if there's a touch of the romantic element, it is of the external and outward only, appealing to life and senses, and not the Celtic romanticism of the imaginative or mystic kind. We do not find in this robust, powerful, and energetic poetry of early England the finer and subtler elements of thought. <coughs> the form of poetry, too, affords no such model in which deep creative thoughts can be expressed. It's too bright and plain to be the vehicle for beauty or subtle poetic intuition to be expressed. The rhythm likewise is of a forcible energy of speech and without the depths and subtler intensities of style. This is the character of early English poetry at least before the times of Chaucer. And one great expression of this early English poetry, and perhaps the solitary one, is to be found in Chaucer himself. And Sri Aurobindo says, with Chaucer, we have absolute exhaustion and cessation of this mode of poetry. Even in the later course of English poetry, these Anglo-Norman traits can be found in form and substance, as in Elizabethan drama, in the poetry of Dryden and Pope and Browning, in 18th century verse, and also the lesser Victorian verse. But there has been brought about a transformation, and this alchemy is due to the Celtic element, which is usually submerged, but emerges in upstreamings and occasional outbursts of power. And then we have poetry expressing the higher urge of thought than is possible through the vital common sense of the Saxon. So that Celtic element adds that blaze of color, light and emotion to the already existing poetic mold. And we find in this transformed poetry, the human hungering for beauty for that ideal which ever eludes but which we want to grasp and cast into poetry. We find a lyrical intoxication and the charm of romance. Though of course it does not yet reach the heights of the Greek and Latin poets who deal sovereignly with life, in Sri Aurobindo's words, in their calm and measured verses driven by the inspired reason. Instead, in English poetry, we have an excitement of thought, as Sri Aurobindo puts it, and earlier, where only externalities of life were portrayed, we have a seeking for what lies behind and beyond life. The creative sight of the poet now pierces the external spirit the outsides of nature in order to probe the mysteries of inner life and sometimes touches the most intimately spiritual too. A vein of subtler sentiments, mysticism of a sort, a pioneer pathos characterize this poetry when refined. The transmutation of passion from violence of vital being into intensity of the soul, vital sensuousness into imaginative beauty, and these are Sri Aurobindo's own phases. So this is affected by a greater aesthetic perception. The lyrical, narrative, and dramatic forms also undergo modifications and take up finer issues and themes and gain in beauty, power, and force. This is the general nature and character of English poetry following the Middle Ages. But at times, 
this poetry strives to rise and go beyond and exceed itself and it goes beyond the english mold and sri aurobindo says it seems to reveal the spirit in things also the intensity of style and rhythm absent in earlier poetic works is at play here due to the refining force which allows poetry its characteristic movement and in its language and music poetry acquires two of its highest qualities the imaginative vision and the peculiar unseizable beauty so we see there are two separate elements which work individually and also there's a commingling of the two and sri aurobindo says when two opposite powers work together when they coalesce and become one the greatest achievement becomes possible for the deficiencies of one is made up for by the other which either is unable to achieve by itself it has also its side of failure but sri aurobindo says the greatest things in english poetry have come out of this fusion it is that on the positive side of this achievement we have the magnificent poetry of the english elizabethans for instance this sri aurobindo says is a fresh outburst and revelation and cut off from the past it is to use his own words self born under the impulse of a new age and environment and in our future discussions we shall be studying elizabethan poetry with lots of examples but this force fades away with time and is replaced with not much of high quality or great verse we have only the lone figure of the epic poet john milton who strives to put intellectual thoughts in the ancient mold of poetry between milton and 18th century poetry there's the thin stream of carolin verse and even this is not of great or permanent importance what follows is even a drier age of the intellectual poetry of 18th century the reign of poets like dryden and pope but the age which immediately succeeds this arid space is once again a fresh and new outburst of the great romantics wordsworth shelley keats blake and others this was a violent break from the past as we shall see later on how different in theme and motive and spirit the romantic poets were from their predecessors their poetry is new in comparison and wonderfully fresh it was a great beginning the romantics had made but unfortunately their successors in the victorian era did not continue along these lines so even this trend was abandoned halfway and could not be brought to full fruition as victorian poets deviated into their own newer ways in place of the finer spirit of romantic poetry these poets give us intellectual stuff which is half artistic external and superficial the age which follows is the modern age and it is also the time in which sri aurobindo was writing out these essays so he says this age is still trying to find itself and modern poets also have reflected the forms and motives of the preceding victorian poets to a certain extent so that in a nutshell is the trend and movement of english poetry up to the 20th century at least its first decades thus we witness the many reversals and revolutions of the poetic spirit but sri aurobindo does not consider these to be any defects or disabilities on the contrary he says this breaking away from the past from time to time opens the way for newer opportunities and achievements which would not be possible by sticking to and continuing one and the same trend and isn't it so rational and logical think about it 
without fresh outbursts, without newer creations, it would be a dull monotony. In fact, form also, see Aurobindo says, is a great power, but then sureness of form is not all. A strong established form gives the poet a firm ground to work upon surely, but it also limits and obstructs his way. If the poet sticks to that form, he cannot venture into or experiment with newer ones. Consider Shakespeare and his sonnet series. He got the sonnet form ready-made and seized on it. But the spirit of adventure brings new revelations if it is successful, Sri Aurobindo says. Okay, remember a whole new landmass was discovered because of the spirit of adventure of a daring soul. In fact, the history of English poetry has been a succession of individual poetic achievements rather than a constant national tradition. That is Sri Aurobindo's assessment. A series of bold experiments, that's one way of defining English poetry. And precisely because of lack of a strong national and cultural tradition, unlike in other European countries, English poets were less shackled by the past and so could make new experiments in new times and under different impetus and environment. <clears throat> and in Sri Aurobindo's words, revolutions are distracting things, but they are often good for the human soul, for they bring a rapid unrolling of new horizons." Unquote. And English poetry has many instances to offer of the success of individual revolts. The defects and limitations are conquered by other powerful forces, and that's as much as can be said about the side of success and greatness of English poetry. And Sri Aurobindo says that its lapses and failures are the price it has to pay for its gains and successes. In the field of English poetry, rather than a tradition or a mass achievement, it is the individual genius which has risen to prominence from time to time, as the poet has been able to work and create directly out of himself and followed boldly his own line of poetic adventure. English poetry is full of new revelations and surprising reversals. And because of this freedom the poets got and their courageous and bold poetic experiments, English poetry is blessed with a richness and wealth of innovations, <coughs> a constant freshness. And to use some of Sri Aurobindo's phrases here, the lavish expenditure of genius, the force of imagination, lambent energy of poetic speech and the constant self-liberation into intensest beauty of self-expression are also the rewards of revolts and revelations. And these are of the greatest value in poetry. And Sri Aurobindo says, these things which characterize English poetry are important also because they lead to possibilities which are of great value for the poetry of the future. Now, Sri Aurobindo dwells so much on the greatness of English poetry, but does not hesitate to point out its faults and failures too. He says, English poetry, where it has been powerful, it has also been imperfect. It displays strength of spirit on the one hand, but is uncertain and tentative in form on the other. Sri Aurobindo further says that English poetry may be extraordinarily stimulative, but not often quite satisfying. And most important of all, though the poets aimed very high, they met, met with little success after all. Maybe this is because the thought power is defeated by the excess of imaginative force. So the English poets have not been able to make their poetry 
great instruments of thought vision, nor have they dealt fruitfully with life, dealing mainly with life's externalities. The uncertainty of motives, unsureness of touch, count among the general failures of English poetry, which <clears throat> often falls short of the mark and sometimes sinks below the normal level also. Sometimes there is great triumph of poetic power, but mainly it is a course of rapid starts and turns because of this uncertainty and therefore we do not find any conscious continuity or sustained perfection anywhere, not that is visible easily. <clears throat> Yet there is a secret underground continuity, but we must dig hard for it. English poetry, however, deviates from the course of the national mind, which has been faithful to its own motive and spirit, and which is why it could escape from shattering changes. The, the spirit of English poetry has been subject to extreme and violent and abrupt revolutions in its course. But one thing Sri Aurobindo points out about the character of English poetry is its almost fixed and constant dwelling on life and action and passion. And this becomes the basis and source and referral point of all else. In Sri Aurobindo's words, a strong hold upon this life, the earth life, is the characteristic of the English mind." Unquote. The Celtic strain adds and leads to an opposite extreme. For the Celtic mind, this life is not all, but only a starting point for the expression of the life beyond and behind. This mind is attracted more by the hidden and secret mysteries of existence. The Latin mind goes beyond life and seeks universal truths and realities. These are, however, not very deep spiritual or soul truths, but those which can be grasped by the intelligence. But the English mind proper is in love with this life for its own sake, as we have been discussing. Everything finally turns upon and works with the external life which the English poet loves in all its externalities, outer individualities, and immediate subjective idiosyncrasies. Even the aesthetic and spiritual motives are subjected to the externalities of life and express something of the physical life only. There are exceptions, of course. For example, the mystic William Blake escapes from this grip of superficialities. The 19th century English romantics have their hearts elsewhere, as Sri Aurobindo puts it. But they are the exceptions. The English love of earthly life is a power in itself and a constant one and attracts even those who have no real genius for it, to quote Sri Aurobindo. This power, this objective turn, is strong enough to have created a national tradition, but it's in fiction, painting, and sculpture, not really in poetry. Because in poetry, <clears throat> something more than mere representation of life is needed. Even satisfying the law of poetic beauty is not enough in itself. For poetry to be true and genuine, it must be a presentation from within rather than a representation of the external or a mere artistic reproduction. The visible object is to be made a symbol of something else and for the superficial and surface life to be turned into the subject of poetry, an intimately subjective vision is needed and the transmutation has to be effected by an inner process. And if this medium is the intuitive mind, if the transmutation is done by the inspired reason, then the presentation of life, even external life, 
becomes an interpretation through which some inner truth may be revealed. But in England, poetry uh, and the English poetry, uh, the attempt has been to reflect life as visible to the outer senses. Their general aim, we can say, is to hold up a mirror to nature. And Sri Aurobindo says, it's the mirror which does the poetizing of life. <clears throat> the medium is the vital and emotional temperament of the poet and the creative and poetic element come from this source. So what we get is a faithfully unfaithful reflection, to use Sri Aurobindo's words. The temperament of the poet affects the transformation as the final presentation is colored by it. But that illusion of the imitation of nature is created even in the transformed representation. This illusion of external reality has been a first canon of Western artistic conceptions. And the English mind carries this conception to its extreme. For it, the foundation of the external and real is safe and firm. So what happens when the individual temperament is given so much importance, when poetry relies heavily on the individual creative mind? Sri Aurobindo says, we have strong results in giving immense importance to this. English poetry becomes more powerfully and consciously personal, with the main aim being transformation of life and nature. The universal and the impersonal are not the direct aim of this poetry. So what happens as a result of this subjective element is that poets, even those writing in the same age and milieu, differ widely in themes and motives from each other. Evidently, the individuality of the poet, the assertion of the personal subjective element gives an independent, different turn to even the common things. In the literature and poetry of other countries, just the reverse of this has taken place until recently, as Sri Aurobindo observed. On the other hand, this assertion of individuality gives a greater intensity of speech and vision and this accounts for a great strength of English poetry. The imaginative, vital and emotional response acquire greater value. The heightening in English poetry thus comes from this individual response of the poet. The intensity of personal utterance and personal vision gives strength and heightens the poetic creation. Whereas Sri Aurobindo notes, in Greek or Indian poetry, the heightening comes mainly from power, is due to the elevation of the medium through which the poet sees life. Okay, so to come back to English poetry, this in general is the character of English poetry with a mixture of faults and strengths, failures and successes. Yet, in spite of its many merits, English literature and culture has not been much successful in influencing the literature of other people. As Sri Aurobindo says, England has received much from Europe but returned very little in comparison. The English have been less effective than others in shaping European culture. The influence of the English mind on Europe is not of any considerable importance. It was, if it had any influence, it was limited and also not always durable. It was, according to Sri Aurobindo, the poetic mind of Greece and Rome that had a great influence on European culture, shaping largely its poetic production.
Greek poetry, which is perfect within its own limits, though, exerted a powerful influence on Europe. Of course, the limits are those set and named by critics. The success of Greek poetry, its flawless power and sufficiency, comes from their life vision. They have worked from the inspired reason and the luminous intellect in dealing with life and they had one large viewpoint. And their enlightened aesthetic sense harmonized all. This harmony, coupled with the fact that they remained faithful to their motive, is the reason of the abiding success of the Greek mind. It is the very essence of the Greek spirit, Sri Aurobindo says. Not only were they faithful to it, they were quite conscious of it, and so were able to achieve that artistic beauty and sufficiency of form which makes their poetry durable and gains the admiration of posterity. In fact, even in its decadence, the Greeks preserved this essence and power and therefore could shape in a great measure Latin literature. For instance, Cicero, Seneca, Catullus, Virgil, great names in Roman literature, all owe something to the Greek in some way or the other. They were influenced by Greece. The Latin writers copied from Greek classical literature themes and forms, and in fact, some Greeks were, Greek works were even translated into Latin. Even the great poet Ovid took something of the Greek classical style. Modern European mind was shaped to a certain extent by Italian and French literature too, though their influence has been less profound than the Greek influence. French poets deal with life through the intellect and less from inspired reason. Unlike the Greek, the French do not possess an enlightened aesthetic sense. Emotional sentiment is their innate power. The intellect and the emotion are two constant powers which go to define the nature of French poetry. From one, they get the brain stuff while the poetical fervor and grace and charm come from the other. And like the Greeks, the French too have remained faithful to these two motives in their poetry, which are its very essence. Because of this fidelity, they could give their poetry a characteristic form. The persistence of a strong motive and a satisfying form together made French poetry forceful enough to wield a huge influence on European literature. The Spain of Calderon or the Germany of Goethe also helped to put their stamp on European mind and though their influence was strong, it could not endure for long. And Sri Aurobindo found among his times the new Russian literature to be an intense cultural force in Europe. But as for England, it could wield no pervading or enduring influence on the European mind. A few great writers like Charles Dickens or Scott or Richardson perhaps left their mark, but in poetry, Sri Aurobindo says, only Byron and Shakespeare could do so. And in Sri Aurobindo's words himself, it was the belated continental discovery of Shakespeare and the vehement and sudden wave of Byron, which influenced Europe to a certain extent. And Sri Aurobindo adds that these two Shakespeare and Byron are the only two names of English poetry that Europe is perhaps familiar with. The cause of this insularity, however, lies not in the reception of the English, but of a reaction. That England has been less effective in influencing European literature and culture is not due to any obtuseness in the mind of Europe 
the defect lies in the insufficiency of literature of literary power in spite of the rich and vigorous poetry that england produced and that may be because of the lack of continuity and lack of a strong national tradition english poetry has mostly been a series of poetical revolutions which of course is not without its rewards but it doesn't make for a strong inner continuity also this poetry could not express well the spiritual attitude of the nation neither could it determine its own artistic forms and without these no literature can hope to have a decisive influence on others and sri aurobindo says and i'm quoting but it is precisely the possession of such a self recognizing spiritual attitude and the attainment of a satisfying form for it which make the poetry of a nation a power in the world's general culture for that which recognizes itself will most readily be recognized by others unquote and england unfortunately could not be such a power nor like the greek or the french gave its achievements the fidelity and recognition it perhaps deserved to put its stamp on the mind of humanity a nation needs to attain a perfect form of its own innate character and so can help and influence in forming others and the english national spirit is obscurely reflected in its poetry but then as sri aurobindo says the poetry of a nation is only one side of its self expression and its characteristics may be best understood if we look at it in relation to the whole mental and dynamic effort of the people unquote and we have seen that in fields of life other than the poetical england has been the leader of the world okay so having said this much about the character of english poetry we may sum up or summarize the general characteristics now first of all external life features in a big way in english poetry and the poets again and again put the higher poetical motives to to forms of this life it would seem that the aim of poetry was to enrich this earthly life so constantly have poets referred to it then the personal subjective element works as a great force in poetic creation which allows for great intensity of speech and sometimes a direct vision and this is the second trait in fact not only in england but in world's literature the tendency to stress the personal temperament the subjective individuality has been on the increase but this in itself is not a failure it leads to more intense response to life and nature when the individual creative mind of the poet lends the colors and lines of his imagination to the interpretation and presentation of life and finds new intensities of word and rhythm which gives the work a deeper insight england too displayed this tendency of stressing the individual element but the defect and failure lay in the inability of the english mind to put the higher motives to their deepest and largest creative results sri aurobindo says but this fault can somewhat be remedied through the influence and intervening of the pure celtic temperament which could be affected through the irish revival now here once again we have to remember that sri aurobindo was writing almost 100 years back and thus using the future tense english poetry has advanced in different directions since then and sri aurobindo had also predicted 
that England could benefit largely from the contribution of the Indian mind too. For instance, Tagore's works could be a major influence. And he said then, if this transformation can be brought about, then English poetry with the innate and natural powers of its spirit will certainly be of the highest value and contribute to the poetry of the future. And that will be when the personality of the poet, his individuality shall be liberated and heightened to a point where they will move to the universal and the impersonal. Subjectivity shall not be discarded, but the personal soul experience will only enrich the universal subjective. We have already seen how English poetry has endowed upon everything a high intensity of speech. And in future, this power of giving the fullest value to word and image shall help in expressing the values of the spiritual. This, Sri Aurobindo says, will be one of the aims of a supreme intuitive utterance. One poetic endeavor will be the pursuit of higher godheads in their own sphere and the other endeavor will be to make them return to earth in order to transform our vision of this earth life. And in his own times, Sri Aurobindo found the beginnings of such a transformation in English poetry and so pronounced that if this is effectively emphasized, then the long stream of English poetry will arrive at a point where it can discover for itself a great utility for all its past powers of its strong creation and utterance. It may go deeper within and may live in a greater spirit of which it has only occasional utterances till now. In future, it may achieve new forms for intuitive utterance and here the Anglo-Celtic spirit will find its highest harmonized and perfect self-expression, Sri Aurobindo says. And when he was writing about the future course of English poetry, the richest and highest and greatest spirit yet remained to be found, which could be put into the service of humanity. So in our next talks, we shall explore the course of English poetry up to the times in which Sri Aurobindo composed the chapters for his book, The Future Poetry. So for today, thank you all so much.